thing. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How's everybody this evening? I want to definitely thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. We uh, had the honor of our drummers from Imani Temple, Ryan King and Bryce Milton, to do the calling. If you know anything about our history, depending on the sound of the drums, what assembly you're being called to. So we definitely want to thank them for being here today. <clears throat> um, they said we couldn't, and we decided decided we can, right? Remember the library debacle? Most of you know what that is. Um, I want to take a minute to recognize our sponsors. Sanbethka, Lafayette NAACP Unit 6060, Southern Coast Supplies, Senator Gerald Boudreaux, Representative Vincent Pierre, Ken Miller, All for One Foundation, Pam and Anthony, A.B. Daniel, Des 2, LLC, La Pless de Creole, K-I-E-E, -E, Business to Business, Made to Clean, Black Folks Talking, Black Voters Matter, uh, Patricia Covert Foundation, and our media sponsors are 100 Black, which is the Black Radio Station, AOC Community, Community Media, the Craven Brothers, KTMG, Keep Them Talking Media. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Castile and Rick and the staff of this beautiful venue. This is the Enterprise Business Center. Uh, we're happy to have a couple of elected officials with us. We have 15th Judicial Judge, Judge Royal Colbert in the house. We have Senator Gerald Boudreaux in the house, and he's on program. Uh, but before we go any further, I would like to uh, call to the mic Ms. Frisco. And if you look on the back of your program, the word to the song is there. Good afternoon, everyone. Ooh, this mic is hot. Okay, so I won't, I won't have to work so hard. How y'all doing this afternoon? Lift every voice, please stand and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoice. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Uh, I, I uh, was a bit rushed, so I do want to come back and uh, list those others who are supporting this, and uh, that is the Lewis A. Berry Institute of Civil Rights and Justice, also Southern University Law Center. This would not be possible without their help. We also have the Lafayette uh, Analytic Council, uh, Alpha Phi Alpha, Alpha Kappa Alpha. Kappa Alpha Psi, Omega Psi Phi, 
Delta Sigma Theta, Phi Delta, Phi Beta Sigma, Zeta Phi Beta, Sigma Gamma Rho, Iota Phi Theta. So I wanna thank all of our sponsors for uh, coming, us, coming with us along this journey and making it happen without these sponsors this would not be possible. Definitely want to tip my hat off to my dear friend, Dr. Williams. This was his grandchild. So I want to thank you for that, Dr. Williams. We want to let it, yes. Let everyone know that the Louisiana Literary and Speaker Series will ensure that Black history is discussed. Uh, we will monitor public libraries programming and ensure Black history is a part of taxpayers funded activities, the side of truth. And we will ensure that the Northside Library is built and it is implemented. Uh, before, uh, next to the mic, uh, we'll have uh, Bishop John Milton to give our purpose and a prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Marja. And thank all of you, sponsors, supporters, originators, and participants. But we want to especially thank all of those who are tuned in from wherever they are. We know that from time to time in this country, we have reached crossroads where we can continue to move forward toward creating a more perfect union, move forward in creating that society that Dr. King once dreamed of. This is one of those moments in history. On this American journey, in this time, we see the recurrence of days gone by whenever it seems that we make two, three, four steps forward, there are those who want to retard the progress. This event, this rising of community, rising of leadership, is partly responsible because of what happened with the Lafayette Parish Public Library System. And that is an event was planned to bring forward a presentation to the community about voters' rights in America. And there are those who felt that it wasn't something that they wanted to hear or support or promote. And we see our library system now putting in a parent or tacit policy, both sides, censoring truth. It is my understanding that that is why we're here, and this is why I am here. To say that there can be no roadblocks that can stop us from moving forward where God has leading us to go. That there can, there can be no manipulation, no censorship that denies people the continued access to truth, to history, and an opportunity to move forward for where we fall short, we might grow into the fullness of what God desires for us as a community, as a state, as a nation, but also for the good sake of all of humanity. So we are grateful to be here, and we are so blessed to be assisted by such an esteemed panel. I ask now that you pray with me as we move forward in our program. Oh, Mother, Father, the great I am, the creator of all things. We thank you, Lord God, for this end gathering that we might push out energy from within to support, O oh Lord God, the common cause of democracy, the common cause of righteousness. 
We ask you now to bless this assembly. Bless each and every person here present and those within the hearing of the voices to be spoken today. Oh, Lord God, let us learn something new today. Let our energies combine, unite together to create that critical mass that will be like rivers flowing that cannot be stopped. But we seek justice, we seek righteousness, oh Lord God, and we seek continued progress toward mankind's perfection. Oh, you have called us to be holy. You have called us to be righteous. Oh Lord God, now support us and grant us the strength to keep on fighting, to keep on keeping on. And oh Lord God, where there are contrite hearts, we ask now that you fix it, Lord that you take control of the situation and allow your will, O oh Lord God, as we submit thereto. We bless your holy name. We bless all of our participants. Let everyone say, I say, I say means I agree. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Mark, can I ask a question? Has anybody here been taught by the great Dr. Lewis Berry. Okay, I'm the only one, thank you. Of course, for Dr. Da Johnson, Dr. Pierre, yeah? I, I took an equity course with Dr. Lewis Berry, so his spirit is among us. Thank you. I um, want to also thank Dr. Ada, Ada Good, Goodley and uh, the Dean, Dean Pierre for their efforts in making this happen as well. Next to the mic, we'll have greetings from Senator Gerald Boudreaux. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here. It's actually a blessing to be here. Um, as the Bishop said, this started because of, you know, one catastrophe leads to an open door. I want to just say to our community and to our leaders and to those who have organized today, thank you for taking that step, that step of faith. I also want to thank the University of Louisiana, specifically Dr. Foster, who is with us today as the, the moderator. A lot of us in the community are not aware of the things that he do behind the scenes on our behalf at that university. His work caused the president of the University of Louisiana Lafayette to take a position, something that a lot of people run from when the heat gets turned up. But he spoke well of what we are trying to do today and what we continue to do in this community. In addition, I want to thank all of the, the panelists that, that uh, are uh, going to participate in the program today. And I know this is a conversation, and, and my part is just to say welcome. But I, I'm, I'd be remiss if I didn't take an opportunity to say as, as the 20, on the 27th day of February during Black History Month, we still have a lot of work to do. And by us coming together, not only today, but all months of this year, to recognize, to highlight, and to, to lead and to serve. And I'll close on service because I think it's so important that those of us who are in positions to serve, that we continue now more than ever. Once again, the bishop alluded to we're at crossroads. We know the road that we want to take, and that's that road that's least traveled because it's the road that's right, it's the road of truth, and it's the road that's going to set us free once and for all. So again, to all who are participating, to the organizers, to the sponsors, and all the supporters, and those who are listening um, to this program today, let's never, never give up. Let's never get tired. Let's never stop fighting. There are so many reasons why we are here today, but the most important thing is about our future. I'm honored to represent District 24 in the Louisiana State Senate, where we come together and we do more for our people and our community. We win every time. God bless and take care. that, Senator Boudreaux, we so appreciate you. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our facilitator for this evening's um, event. Uh, 
He is a history professor at UL, and I'll let him tell a little bit more about himself, Dr. Theodore Foster. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Marjorie Broussard, uh, for the prayer, as well as for uh, the Lift Every Voice and Sing um, Memoration. I haven't heard the song uh, sang in uh, company or communion in a while, uh, not only because of COVID, um, but because of my newness uh, to the Lafayette community. Uh, I arrived fall 2019 uh, and currently serve as Assistant Professor of African American History uh, in the Department of History. Um, I earned my PhD in Black Studies from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Um, I have a master's in African American and African Studies from The Ohio State University. And I earned my undergrad from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where I am from. And it is Birmingham that I will uh, call upon a bit uh, in my opening remarks. Before I continue, uh, I should just let you know the kind of run of the rest of the show. We have five excellent panelists I want to hear from as someone who spent uh, the six years prior to 2019 in Chicago and as someone who is from Birmingham, uh, Southern Town, uh, a different South than this Gulf South. I look forward to hearing more about the local struggles that many of you have been involved in. Um, before I begin, um, the opening remarks uh, brought me to an African proverb uh, that I love. Um, that comes from a book um, titled Lifelines, uh, the Black Book of Proverbs by one of my first uh, professors in undergrad, Dr. Askari Johnson Hodari. Um, and in this excellent tomb of wisdom uh, lies this uh, proverb that I think the point about crossroads speaks to um, in questions of progress and how we look at that. Uh, youths look at the future, the elderly at the past, how ancestors live in the present. And this is a proverb that comes from Kenya in the ethnic group uh, Lua. So uh, we want to hear from our panelists. So I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes to lay out some of the context and my uh, experience uh, with this uh, library fiasco and some of the response. Um, OK. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask the Lua master of can see this uh, musty beard. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, um, so our panelists will speak for about seven to ten minutes uh, a piece after I open uh, with some remarks. Uh, we'll allow some time for them to speak with each other and then uh, we'll open it up to QA. So um, let me begin. I have some written remarks so I can keep on script as well as some uh, riffing I hope to do about um, one local uh, black woman. Uh, in particular, whose history I think we should, should center in this moment, uh, in Rupert Richardson, former NAACP president, uh, national president, as well as local uh, president here in Indiana. Uh, it is important for me to note at the outset that my role in this fiasco is the consequence of simply being Black and professor, which is not to say that it is simple being a Black professor in academia or the US, but the climate in Southwest Louisiana like the rest of the nation and indeed world, is anti-Black. And that means that at any moment, people who are racialized as Black or teach and study the history of Black peoples can become the subject of criminalization by state. It is a kind of script easily taken up by bad faith actors claiming objectivity or neutrality or an apolitical stance in relation to voter suppression, white supremacy, and anti-Blackness. Libraries like universities and academic scholarship have never been neutral in the fight and reproduction of whiteness or white supremacy. It is a script that marks the experience of some of my favorite black history makers like Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, the first black person to earn a PhD from Harvard University in 1895 and criminalized by the U.S. government and even the NAACP, which he co-founded in 1906. Because of his ad advocacy, for socialist, communist, and leftist black politics. Born in 1868, Du Bois died in exile in Ghana, which became the first independent African nation in 1957 following European colonialism. 
Fellow Birmingham native, Dr. Angela Yvonne Davis was also criminalized by the state in 1969 because of her membership with the Communist Party USA. She was stripped of her assistant professorship in philosophy at UCLA by then governor of California, Ronald Reagan. After a court ruled that rationale for firing Davis was illegal, the university fired her again for the use of inflammatory language. In Davis's 2006 book, Abolition Democracy, which I couldn't recommend more as this is you know, a launch for uh, literary engagement in the black community. She writes, consider the fact that Martin Luther King Jr. was repeatedly described by his adversaries as a communist, and not because he was actually a member of the Communist Party, but because the cause for racial equality was assumed to be a communist creation. Anti-communism enabled resistance to civil rights in myriad ways and vice versa. Racism enabled the spread of anti-communism. In other words, racism has played a critical role in the ideological production of the communist, the criminal, and the terrorist. So one thing my re remarks are trying to get at is this, you know, pull on the one end of the kind of criminalization of black life, black history, black thought, black dialogue, black voting, at the same time, a kind of resistance to that that we see in this event and broader efforts um, to speak truth uh, to this power. And so I think it's important for us during Black History Month to be explicit and precise about the role of criminalization, anti-blackness, and racism in the Lafayette Public Library Board of Control's decision to reject the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, $2,700 grant, that's how much money they rejected, for books, Gary May's Bending Toward Justice, the Voting Rights Act and the Transformation of American Democracy. It's about Selma and how the Voting Rights Act came to be. I should say that my research focuses on the historical memory of the civil rights movement, how politicians, institutions, corporations, activists take up that memory and try to activate it in different locales and in different ways. Indeed, the board uh, chair, Douglas Palumbo, uh, mentioned to me in an email that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was the greatest uh, American uh, he ever knew, which is to say that he's calling upon a certain history of MLK that is comfortable and convenient that should be a contradiction given the actions by the board. The program is a very mainstream and timely engagement with the history of voting rights in the U.S., which cannot be understood without a rigorous engagement with Black history. LEH identified six books to spark critical dialogue of which libraries applying for the grant would choose four. The other book I was gonna speak on is Martha Jones' Vanguard, How Black Women uh, Fought for the Right to Vote and Equality for All. The funding allows for each library to purchase 20 copies of each for their public in their areas. And I heard that uh, they were sold out within 24 hours uh, once UL Dupree Library took up the grant. Um, even Jefferson Davis Parish, right, named after the former president of the Confederacy, uh, applied for this grant and accepted this grant. LEH deserves a lot of credit for coordinating and developing an excellent discussion, which I contribute to an overall program intended to raise the public's literacy of the history of voting rights and efforts to suppress the vote. They mentioned several of the themes and issues as the expansion of voting rights since the country's founding, the electoral process, the women's suffrage movement, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the 2013 Supreme Court decision that invalidated key portions of the Voting Rights Act, and the disenfranchisement of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated Americans. Those are the bullet point list that uh, themes that these six books written by academics were meant to provide a context for a discussion that I was only supposed to facilitate as a scholar of Black history and voting rights. It is then not a coincidence that by simply agreeing to support a local librarian's application for the statewide grant that a black professor who teaches and researches black history at the university down the road was prevented from facilitating a discussion about a book by a black woman author about the role of black women's overlooked historical and contemporary contribution to voting rights. And all of this because of the, the five to two board decision or determination that I and the other faculty administrator or facilitator uh, were quote extremely extremely far left. So this connection with Angela Davis and MLK and the kind of criminalization of black life, simply for arguing for racial equality, whatever label is necessary, extremely far left, communist, 
criminal is conjured up. While we can talk about the board's overreach into the programming of the library or question what they mean when they say the other side needed to be represented, I think it is most instructive to understand the criminalization of black life and history as a product of the afterlife of slavery. By the afterlife of slavery, I mean what Sadia Hartman describes as the devaluing of black life by a racial calculus and brutal arithmetic entrenched centuries ago that skews life chances, limits access to health and education, produces premature death, incarceration, and impoverishment. I learned uh, last week that the life expectancy of all US citizens went down one year and it went down three years for black US citizens. Here I think of the historic intersection of the struggle for voting rights, state violence, and black death. For example, in order to understand how the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed, requires understanding how the murder of 26-year-old Jimmy Lee Jackson by a white Alabama state trooper galvanized organizers to propose a Selma to Montgomery march. The original plans included dumping Jackson's dead body on the footsteps of the state capitol in Montgomery, which is detailed in very dramatic fashion in this book, Bending Toward Justice. He was shot in the stomach 56 years ago last week, two weeks ago, February 18th, during an evening protest and died eight, eight days later from an infection due in part by the fact that the hospital he was taken to initially lacked the resources, a blood bank, to perform surgery and thus had to be transported 30 miles to another hospital. In 2010, the state trooper who shot him, James Bernard Fowler, was sentenced to six months in jail after pleading guilty to manslaughter and publicly apologizing for killing Jackson, who again was killed in 1965. Here in Lafayette, the August 21st, 2020 police shooting of 31-year-old Trafer Pellerin echoes the state violence against Jimmy Lee Jackson in 1965. We still do not know the name officers who shot Pellerin and the issue of voting rights is always directly connected to the criminalization of black life as an injustice that repeats. The demand to see black people as full humans and citizens implied by the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 requires a critical teaching of black history within and beyond the classroom, which is why I'm really excited about this event and broader project today. So this brings me to Rupert Richardson, who I learned about through her grandson, who's a PhD student at Duke. Uh, university. And he was just, you know, posting on Twitter about his impressive grandmother. And, you know, I was drafting this syllabus for this Black women's history class that I'm teaching at UL this semester. And I thought, you know, how can I better center Black women history makers in the local region? So again, Rupert Richardson was born 1930 in Lake Charles, Louisiana. She is a graduate of Southern University um, and served eight years as vice president of the NAACP locally or in the state, and also had a 16-year tenure, tenure as president of the Louisiana State Conference of the NAACP. Um, so I'm just read some facts about her contribution. Um, this is what Julian Bond said about her during her funeral. Uh, Rupert Richardson, who died in 2008, uh, served the NAACP in many, many capacities, but she will be best remembered as a tireless crusader for justice in Louisiana. She led the National Health Committee of the NAACP, working to recruit HIV AIDS cases, and she started her own healthcare consulting firm in 1994 after retiring as Louisiana's Deputy Assistant Secretary of Alcohol and Drug Abuse. She also worked at the state level in the areas of health planning, mental health, employment, and substance abuse. Um, I implore you to look her up online if you type in LPB, Louisiana Public Broadcasting, and Rupert Richardson, you'll see an excellent 1983 interview with her where she's really reflecting on the long movement she had been a part of most of her life, right? She said there was a slogan in the NAACP in the 1950s, completely free by 53, that they then repeated in 63 because the slogan still rang, but the fight for freedom also still uh, was needed. Um, she said that uh, in 63, right, the year before the passage of the, voting, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that they had the NAACP arrived at a plane without realizing that there was going to be an ongoing need 
in goaltending for this fight for freedom that would be eventually eroded, certainly over her lifetime and certainly as we see now. So um, I'm going to conclude with an excerpt from the Martha Jones book. Since this was billed as a book discussion. I want to center some of the, the words and commentary that she has about Black women in the fight for voting rights, as well as a quote from another Birmingham Black woman history maker and native who I draw a lot of inspiration from, and uh, Dr. Sonia Sanchez. But this is from the book uh, Vanguard by Martha Jones, and she's talking about Black women in the 1850s. There's never been a moment in which Black women had not been fighting for the rights, not only for themselves, but for everyone, because indeed the intersection of race and gender demands a certain undoing of the ways in which white supremacist violence has continued to endure over the centuries. By the end of the 1850s, when black women exercised their power, they might have faced opposition, but no longer was anyone surprised. They had made themselves visible at public gatherings, church conferences, political con conventions, benevolent society meetings. They still served meals or attended to the comfort of a speaker or a delegate, but they also insisted on claiming their own time at the podium and during deliberations. Black women challenged the politics of the 1850s by what they did and by what they said. They were loyal to organizations in which they could battle against both racism and sexism. They crafted their own definition of women's rights, one drawn from their experiences with the indignity of forced labor, the scourge of sexual assault, and their rough handling on streetcars and trains. These critiques steered the course of a new women's movement, one with black women at the helm. And again, this is the 1850s, a decade before the Civil War, when slavery was formally uh, legal. Uh, so lastly, Sonia Sanchez, just thinking about the question of where we are and where we're going. Again, Rupert Richardson was drawing on this long black freedom struggle that she was a part of for 20 years prior to the 1960s. And the question was asked to her in 1983, well, where is that fervor now, right? I think often the 60s can be this kind of boogeyman that scares us into not acting in the ways that we can now. That's often the misrepresentation of those struggles and battles that were very local in nature. In response to how 86-year-old Angela Davis wants to be remembered, or uh, Sonia Sanchez wants to be remembered, she says, I would like people to know that I've lived a life of being Black in America, and I have had some beautiful things happen, and I have suffered, but I am fortunate enough to know that I haven't suffered the way that many have suffered and continue to suffer. I am hoping this COVID will bring us closer together, my brother. This wasn't put here to inconvenience people. We will not have normal. We will never have normalcy again. The water has been clearing up. Something is happening on this earth. People are beginning to see the tops of mountains. Yes, people are dying, but we need to look at also saving the planet. We must save ourselves, but we must also save this earth. We need to finally answer the question, what does it mean to be human? How do we walk the earth? How do we walk it? And how do we talk it with a genuine sympathy? In Black Studies and the Nation and being a part of New York Corps, or becoming a part of the Black Arts Movement, I went in and I came out with more information. And it has formed me. It has not deformed me. It has not malformed me. It has formed me. I'm an 86 years of age woman whose work continues. And it will continue to my last breath. What I'm saying to you, my brother, is this is how I have moved on this earth. I have tried to move on this earth in a righteous way. So with those opening remarks, I am really interested in learning more from uh, the panelists and we'll uh, ask them to introduce themselves and we'll go in the order that's listed in the program, uh, which begins with uh, Ms. Alana Odoms, Executive Director of ACLU. I'll keep uh, some time, but again, ask that you try and keep your remarks as close to seven to 10 minutes as possible so we can get everyone in. Thank you. Professor Foster, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really honored to be here uh, in celebration of the close of Black History Month and uh, also to talk about the incredible um, and fundamental right to vote and what that means in the state of Louisiana. I am the first African-American woman to hold the title of executive director in the 65 year history of the ACLU. And for folks who don't know our origin stories, 
Uh, we were uh, founded um, at the early part of uh, the civil rights movement in 1956, and our founders sought to fight against segregation laws and miscegenation laws and essentially started holding uh, mixed race meetings. And, you know, what I've taken from knowing our deep history in uh, Louisiana and in, you know, for many reasons and, and in many ways us being um, at the, I think, epicenter of the birth of racial segregation in this nation, um, I've chosen to look at the work of the ACLU through a lens of racial justice. And what that means is that we are the ACLU that uh, traditionally looks at issues of First Amendment and um, freedom of religion, um, but we also now primarily focus on um, ending mass incarceration, ending structural racism in our, um, in our criminal legal system, um, ensuring voting rights to those communities whose right to vote has been violently suppressed, which are all Black people in this country, whether it be through uh, actual physical violence and harm or through incarceration, which you spoke about, Professor Foster. So our work, uh, again, always looks right at that intersection between constitutional liberties and racial justice. And I think that's something that I want, especially the Black community to understand, because I don't think traditionally the ACLU has been received as an or a racial justice organization, but I am um, really committed to making sure that our resources and that our activism and that our energy and that our litigation and advocacy really seek to um, focus deeply on how we can um, uh, protect and defend those folks who have been the primary um, um, focus of the slings and arrows of racism and racial segregation. Uh, and Jim Crow, of course, because we'll really we'll all, all that we've seen, and I think this has been you know, posited by many scholars, but we've really just seen a transformation from slavery and the you know, civil code and the code noir, black codes, which codified human bondage of black people. And you've you know, seen that translated from um, you know, black codes into criminal statutes that are essentially burst out of that, um, that same, you know, denial of humanity and human dignity for black people. Um, and then once again, translated uh, through Jim Crow and into mass incarceration today, which is why we take such a specific look um, at mass incarceration and, and ex exploring and interrogating the reasons why our criminal legal system continues to produce uh, the same outcomes for Black individuals, which are um, greater pretrial incarceration. So folks who are spending time behind bars who have yet to be charged uh, or who are awaiting their, uh, their fair and speedy trial under their Sixth Amendment constitutional rights. People who are largely serving longer times in prison than their uh, counterparts who are racialized as white and a greater difficulty integrating back into uh, the community once they have been convicted of a crime. And uh, one of the collateral consequences, and I wish we wouldn't refer to them as collateral because losing your right to vote is certainly not peripheral. This is something that is central to who we are as human beings. It is central to our, um, our rights of citizenship. Um, um, Martha talks so much about, you know, maybe not in the Vanguard book, but in her other text, Birthright Citizenship, you know, the, the amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, you know, guaranteed uh, birth, uh, not just a freedom from slavery, allegedly uh, ending slavery, but also codifying birthright citizenship. And that if you were born in this country, you have the right to vote and you are a citizen of this nation. And what happens with that carve out in the 13th amendment that says, but if you are convicted of a crime, we can still enslave you. And how significantly that still impacts our everyday, um, our everyday um, society. And so the ways that we've seen that impacted most of all is we've seen, of course, if we in Louisiana, we're the most incarcerated place in the world per capita, uh, but also we have more people behind bars pretrial than any other place in the country. So you have people who are um, otherwise would not be incarcerated you have more stringent penalties here. And you have before before the legislation that provided for re-enfranchisement of people who had felony convictions, you saw the, the 70,000 people in Louisiana impacted because of a prior felony 
conviction and that impacting their right to vote. So we are talking about not just hundreds of people. We're talking about tens of thousands of people who are, um, you know, who are prevented from accessing this really critical right to vote. And then even beyond that, what we've seen in Louisiana and what we saw just in this last uh, election season is that voter suppression is a political strategy for folks. It is, you know, you, you know, you talk about the uh, liberal ideology versus conservative ideology. And some folks, many folks don't even have any policy uh, platform whatsoever. They're just pushing voter suppression. Like that's just the whole entire gamut of what they want to do. So whether they're telling you that the issue is about fraud, whether they're suggesting that providing people with the opportunity to get to the polls earlier is something that will lend itself to fraud or some other kind of, 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 of negative consequence of voting. Um, when they're telling you that people who have COVID or other health concerns should not have the, have access to mail-in ballots. This is all, these are all voter suppression tactics. They may not look like the poll taxes and literacy tests that we saw that took place in the Jim Crow era, but we, they have the exact same impact. And so, you know, there are many organizations in the state of Louisiana that are doing a phenomenal job and a beautiful job, Power Coalition uh, for Justice, um, uh, Black Voters Matter, um, you know, um, Citizen She, so, so many amazing grassroots organizations that are doing this difficult work, Vote, Voice of the Experience, uh, working on behalf of formerly incarcerated people. Um, but we've got to remember that we have to continue to interrogate all of the ways which voter suppression shows up. And again, I think one of the newest ways we need to start looking at it is preparing for redistricting and understanding that redistricting is the civil rights, I think, um, a question of our day. And now we have to look at representation and what it means to have adequate representation that is not diluted, that allows for the voices of black and brown community members to be heard and for us to be able to have that representation in our in our uh, state houses, in the, both the House and the Senate, but also in our judicial branches and also at the Supreme Court. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, that brings, uh, me to an announcement I should make. <clears throat> I'll make this uh, throughout our conversation. Louisiana Literary and Speaker Series will ensure that Black history is discussed. We will monitor public library programming and ensure Black history is a part of taxpayer-funded activities. The side of the truth. Over 100 books of Bending Court Justice and Vanguard are being distributed to area lo uh, schools, local libraries, youth groups, etc. To request books, please call 337-501-7617. That number is 337-501-7617. Also, ensure the Northside Lafayette Library is built and implemented. These are some of the um, demands and conversations that this literary series is meant to help spark as part of an ongoing strategy. Uh, next, I'd like to hear from uh, Jean-Pierre Esquire, professor uh, and Dean of Southern University Law Center. Good afternoon. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure for me to be participating in this. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Chris Williams for giving me a call that uh, gave us the impetus to help put this together and uh, Doc Goodley for really working hard to pull together this panel and everything else that's going. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I feel very honored to be on this panel with such esteemed leaders like uh, Ms. Odoms, uh, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Ernest Johnson, Professor Margaret Burnham, who uh, I will say this, they have been on the battlefield, Professor Burnham, she's going to be too shy to tell you that, but she was in Mississippi in 1964. So when you have a discussion about 1963, 1964, 65, she was in Mississippi in 1964. And Ernest Johnson, uh, this is the 35th anniversary of a lawsuit that he filed uh, that essentially uh, used very powerfully the Voting Rights Act 
to ensure that black judges would be elected in the state of Louisiana and the whole idea of black representation throughout the legislature and city councils uh, uh, and uh, many of the uh, parish governmental agencies were as a result of the precedent that was set in that case and his skill in negotiating outcomes. So uh, they are very, very, very important parts of this whole issue of voting. So let me let me kind of give you a couple of things about from a historical context. And I told you it was 35 years ago that Ernest Johnson filed this lawsuit. I think originally it was Clark versus Edwards, and it became Clark versus Romer. It is known as Clark versus Romer. But they were essentially carrying on the work of lots of people, especially people from southwest Louisiana. Uh, Ernest Johnson had a long history with Rupert Richardson out of Lake Charles. But there's another name out of Lake Charles that I think you should know about. His, his name is Weldon Rougeau. Uh, uh, Weldon Rougeau uh, uh, grew up in Lake Charles, and I know he heard a lot from uh, Rupert Richardson, and actually he was inspired by a man who was a, a parks and recreations uh, leader in Lake Charles that had built into them the fire about them being transformative. And Weldon Rougeau caught that fire. He originally was born in St. Landry Parish, okay, and moved to Lake Charles. But Weldon Rougeau was so entranced by that fire that he walked, he hitched hike from Lake Charles, Louisiana to Baton Rouge to go to Southern University. And he was part of a group of young leaders that were involved in voting rights in the early 60s, 1961, as well as a companion group that was dealing with the, uh, the Freedom Riders. To show you how important his work was, Weldon Rougeau, for the simple task of trying to organize black people to vote, was not only jailed, but he was put into solitary confinement for almost two months, okay? He was subsequently expelled from Southern University. He went to uh, undergraduate school elsewhere, went and got a law degree, uh, became a very influential uh, leader uh, 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 and partner in a very important um, law firm. And just recently, his son, Vincent Rougeau, became the first African-American lay president of Holy Cross University. Now, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because we have to think about the impact of our fight for voting and what that means for us, because we sometimes can't see the outcomes now. But if we put our efforts today forward, we can see outcomes that affect everything else we do. And it is those kinds of things that I think that are very, very important, which is worth the discussions that we will have today and going forward, because we're committed to having those discussions. So. Uh, uh, Ernest Johnson can tell you more, but you know, in 1986, when he began that journey, uh, there were some people in the Lafayette area in Southwest Louisiana, Sylvia Cooks, for example, uh, Eugene Thibodeau, uh, they were all part of that battle. Uh, and that's chronicled by an article uh, by a colleague who couldn't join us today, Jonathan Augustine, about the impact of voting and why the Voting Rights Act is important. So one of the most important legislative agendas that I think we have to have over the next four years is to bring the Voting Rights Act back to its former glory. Uh, uh, and so that, that the impact of voting, because what you see in Georgia and Arizona and all these places are patently open opportunities to essentially quell voting rights of black people, of minorities. That's, that's what it's all about. And it goes back actually to a time in reconstruction where Louisiana blacks were making progress. 
and they were being led by people. Of course, we many of us know about PBS Pinchback, but there was also a, a, a man from Southwest Louisiana named W.W. W. Stewart, who was also part of that whole legacy. And their ability to control and change the politics of Louisiana in favor of black people were quelled, all right, by the election in 1876 of Rutherford B. Hayes. So we're coming on a number of different anniversaries that I want to point out to you so that you can think about these things and recognize that we are at a critical time. And if we don't stand up now, we'll be part of that anniversary. 160 years ago, in 1861, the first shots were fired that led to the Civil War. In 1866, the 13th Amendment, which was part of the 13th, the 14th, I call it the Holy Trilogy Amendments, was enacted. A hundred years ago, in May and in June, there was the Tulsa riots, whereby black people were massacred in Tulsa. Why? Because they were reaping the benefits of their voting and economic prowess. In 1946, because of the racial prejudice and the, the lack of rights of blacks, a man named Charles Drew died because he couldn't get plasma, something he invented for blood transfusion. In 1946, 75 years ago, a very courageous man named Charles Hatfield dared challenge the state of Louisiana to access legal education. And so he filed a lawsuit that would essentially lead to the opening of Southern University Law School and Southern University Law Center. And in 1976, Ernest Johnson and Janice Clark, 30 years after that suit graduated, from law school and 10 years later, they changed the history. So what I'm trying to say to you is that we have a time now to recognize the significance. What you are doing today is very, very important. And we must not forget all those significant changes that happened because other people put their lives on the line. And today we have to be willing to put our lives, our reputation, our wealth, everything on the line because this is such a critical time. Do not be fooled. All the things that you're seeing now is about 10 to 20 years from now. When I say 10 to 20 years from now, folks who are white recognize that people of color will be the overwhelming majority of people in the United States, either by 2030 or 2040. This is their last stand. And we must recognize that at all levels, and we must fight to oppose all those things at all levels so that the January 6th incident that happened in the nation's capital will not be happening on your doors. Thank you. Thank you uh, <clears throat> very, very much, uh, Dr. Pierre. Um, I really appreciate the <coughs> black history in Louisiana that you centered in, the, in, in those comments. I think it's also important to note, as you alluded to, and as Alana Odoms also spoke to, um, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of the restriction of voting rights. It was in 2013 that a Supreme Court decision dealing with the richest county in one of the poorest states my home state, unfortunately, which brought us in many ways, the Voting Rights Act of 65 and the 64 Civil Rights Act has also been the site of restricting the right to vote. This was, what, it's uh, 2021, so yeah, eight years ago that Supreme Court Justice, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts said that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was an extraordinary measure for an extraordinary time that has passed. And what he's saying there is that systemic racism is no longer an issue in the U.S., and we know this because of black elected officials like Senator Boudreau, like Barack Obama. But ask yourself, how many black governors have been elected in the U.S., and why? This issue of redistricting is so key to the work of the governor, among other 
uh, kind of power. So it's, it's important to have black elected officials. It's important to understand, as Alana Odom's pointed to, uh, voter suppression is a political strategy. Since 65, there have been repeated efforts to undercut the Voting Rights Act. It just took almost 50 years for them to do so. And they won. And now it is up to Congress, unfortunately, to prove that systemic racism exists to the extent that they would then reinstitute the Voting Rights Act in 65. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Pierre uh, already sort of brought uh, Ernest Johnson into the conversation. Um, and so I think it would be uh, timely to invite him to offer some comments uh, for today. You're going out of order. <laughs> I thought Attorney Burnham would be next. You want me to go now? We can go women first if you prefer. Yes, ladies are always first. Excellent. That's what my mother taught me. Margaret Burnham. We just need you to unmute. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thrilled to be here. Uh, utterly thrilled to be here. And uh, my uh, my thanks so much to those who've convened this and for those uh, with whom I've been working uh, in Southeast uh, Louisiana and at uh, Southern University uh, for the last, um, well, I'd say six or seven years at least. Uh, Chancellor uh, Pierre and uh, Ada Goodley of the director of the uh, Louis A. Um, Berry Institute for Civil Rights and Justice. Uh, my name uh, is Margaret Burnham. I teach at Northeastern University School of Law, where I am a distinguished professor of law and African American studies, and I am the director of the founder and director of the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project uh, at Northeastern. Uh, Northeastern's project, uh, CRRJ, is in partnership with the uh, Louise A. Berry Institute, and I will tell you a little bit more about that partnership in a moment. Uh, but since uh, Angela uh, Davis's name uh, was uh, raised up by uh, uh, Professor Foster, and since uh, John Pierre uh, mentioned 1963 and 1964 in Mississippi, let me tell you about my own uh, black history, as it were. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, at a public housing, uh, in a public housing um, comple uh, complex. Uh, Angela Davis uh, was our uh, neighbor, uh, and our families, uh, my family and her family, uh, became uh, quite close uh, in our childhood. Uh, we grew up together, um, and then in uh, 1972, uh, when Angela Davis was arrested, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be, at that point, a practicing lawyer and uh, went out to California to, uh, to represent her. Uh, I've been back to Birmingham uh, many times since and consider it my native, ci my native city, although, as John mentioned, uh, I also have really close connections with Mississippi, where I graduated from Tougaloo College. Uh, I want to lift up uh, a, uh, the name of a very close friend, uh, who I visited uh, just last week in Florida. And, and I would ask you uh, to hold him in your thoughts and prayers. His name is uh, Bob Moses. Uh, Bob Moses was one of the, um, the uh, uh, leaders of the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which, uh, of which I was also a member. Um, and he's really quite ill uh, in hospice at the moment. Uh, he, uh, he, he too uh, represents an enormous, um, um, enormous amount of uh, the history of the 20th century. Uh, and indeed, it, it was really Bob's work um, that raised up a, a voice on the question of voting uh, that had not been heard uh, from before. Uh, Bob's position always was um, that those of us who are educated have uh, one job, and that's to listen to and be educated by and hear from those who've had not had our advantages. Uh, and the first uh, real powerful voice uh, on voting um, in this country, well, one of the first, I will say, uh, not the first, but certainly uh, one of the main voices of the 20th century uh, was a voice um, that Bob lifted up, and that was Fannie Lou Hamer. 
who spoke to a national audience um, in 1965 from Atlantic City uh, about how she, as a sharecropper from Mississippi, she too had the right to vote. Now, today, folks, we're talking about two linked phenomena. Uh, that is to say, uh, the, the uh, centuries-old effort uh, to tell the African-American story, to, excuse me, to rob African-Americans of their story, of their literacy, of their knowledge, of their truth. Uh, by miseducating them uh, and by essentially burning their books or removing their books or censoring their books. And the twin uh, story of depriving African Americans of the right to vote. These have been linked in our history uh, for generations. Uh, we, weren't, uh, in, in, we weren't able to read. Why? Because if we were able to read, we might be able to fight for our rights. Uh, we were intentionally uh, subjected to sharecropper education, uh, to apartheid education for two centuries. Why? Because otherwise we might be able to rise up and fight for and claim our place in this democracy. Uh, we were uh, and you're too dumb, why? Because we haven't given you the education that you would need in order to pass the literacy test. You don't know how to read uh, a paragraph of the Mississippi Constitution? Why? Because you haven't been educated. So these two, these two phenomena, which we are here to talk about today in the context of the decision made by the a uh, parish library to keep books away from our community and out of our circulation, to keep the truth buried, that is tied to the uh, denial, the continuing ongoing denial of the right to vote. And these efforts, they're chameleon-like, chameleon the efforts to maintain control over our democratic participation, our literacy and, ac and, and access to the truth. So it was the literacy test of yesterday. And then it was, uh, we're gonna throw you all in prison and then you won't be able to vote. And now it's the re redistricting. And uh, for on the education front, it's we want our own cities. We want out of a Baton Rouge, East Baton Rouge Parish. We want out of this community. We want out, we want to create our own educational system. And on and on, as soon as we identify and come back and prevail over one method of democratic exclusion or of uh, in, uh, maintaining uh, us uh, in, in a state of semi-literacy. As soon as we prevail over one method, a new one will crop up. Now, I, I want to really spend my time, not on that, I, I, I wanted to say that, but, but I, I want to spend my time on the work that I'm doing with Ada Goodman, uh, Goodley and tell you a little bit about it. And, I, and, and this is in the context of Dr. Foster's remark about the afterlife of slavery. Our work at the seminar, at the uh, Civil Rights and Restorative Justice uh, Project, uh, combined with that of uh, Southern University Law Center, is about the afterlife of Jim Crow. And our position is that more focus needs to be on Jim Crow for a range of reasons, for the practical reason that those who suffered from Jim Crow, those who are the immediate legacy of Jim Crow, the systems and the individuals are with us in 2020. We need not, do. should we remember slavery, of course, should we get recompense, repair, and reparations for slavery? Of course. But folks, we have not done our job of fully understanding 
Jim Crow. And without, without an understanding of Jim Crow, we can't fix today. We can't fix today, right? And so our work, uh, my work uh, as a legal scholar is to recover all of the ways in which Jim Crow shortened our lives and killed our people. And to, uh, and to recover the stories of those that are available to us today that have not yet been touched on that subject. And I'll, I'll let me share one with you. Ada Goodley and I together investigated the case of Edwin Williams. Edwin Williams was a young man in his 30s in Algiers, uh, uh, Orleans Parish. His wife's name was Lillian Alvarez Williams and together they had four children. They worshiped at the beautiful Zion Baptist Church in Algiers. And on one Wednesday evening in 1943, Edwin Williams, his wife, and two of their four children walked the short distance from their home to the beautiful Baptist church. As they walked down the streets of Algiers, three white sailors who had been out carousing and drinking threw beer on Lillian Alvarez Williams and the baby in her arms. And Edwin protested and sought to protect his wife. At that point, the sailors came down from the viaduct where they were standing and to shorten this story somewhat, cracked the beer bottle open and stabbed Edwin to death. Lillian quickly told the police who came and gathered evidence. She went to the NAACP headquarters in New Orleans and reported what had transpired and the national office got involved. Now here's where voting comes, in, comes into play. In the thousands of cases that we are investigating, very few of them ever go to a jury. In part because of the persistence of the Louisiana, New Orleans NAACP, John will remind me what the, guy, what the, 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 the um, director of the NAA, it escapes me at the moment. Because of their persistence, this case went to a jury. The story of what happened to her husband was provided by Lillian Alvarez, now a widow with four children, and her neighbor, a woman who had one child and no partner. As against that story, the soldiers lied, the sailors lied and said, that Edwin was the attacker and that shortly after they got into a fight with Edwin, black people came from all around and joined the fight. That's the story. The all white jury of 12 men, remember 1943, no access to the polls, meant no jurors, no black judges. That's the story they believed. And in 30 minutes, the uh, perpetrators of the murder of Edwin Williams were set free. And a few days later, the War Department put them on a ship and the ship sailed for Europe where they joined forces fighting in World War II. When Ada and I started uh, investigating this case, I said to Ada, they've got to be family members. We've got to find them. And Ada found 
the son who was in the, his mother's arms, in Lillian's arms. He's the pastor now of that church, the beautiful Baptist church, Zion Baptist church. I don't know whether it's still Zion, but the beautiful, I don't know whether it's still a mission church. It was once. Beautiful Zion Baptist church. And he told Ada, some of what he told her was in confidence, but suffice here to say, I cannot talk about this. And I pushed Ada and I said, Ada, someone wants to know this story. And she pushed and eventually she found the family members, the grandsons and the granddaughter of Edwin Williams. And indeed, they wanted to know what happened to their grandfather and how their grandmother, who then became the snow cone lady of Algiers because she had to sell snow cones to support her four boys. They wanted to know why they had never been told this story of what really happened to their grandfather. This my brothers and sisters, was a story we were able to relate to them two or three months ago in the year 2020, or perhaps even 2021. So yes, there is an afterlife of slavery, we see it in mass incarceration. We see it when we have to fight for felon voting. We understand about mass incarceration as the new Jim Crow. And, and every black judge who's ever sat in a courtroom, and I count myself among them because I was once a judge, smells the stench of slavery in her courtroom, sees the white police officers on one side and the black a dock on the other. So we know about the afterlife of slavery. But folks, what we don't know about fully, what we are every day discovering is the afterlife and the present life of Jim Crow. And if we lose this story, if we do not look for Edwin Williams' family members, that story will always be the jury verdict. It will never be what truly happened to Edwin Williams that Wednesday night in Algiers, Orleans County. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Burnham, for those very powerful remarks. Uh, couldn't agree more uh, that we need to talk more about the afterlife of Jim Crow uh, and an excellent uh, scholar who I learned from, who I'm sure you know, in Charles Payne, um, has written kind of extensively on this question of memory and how you remember um, the civil rights movement. Uh, he writes in one essay, uh, we think of the movement as a movement for civil rights and against segregation even those seemingly innocuous terms carry their own historical baggage. Segregation became the accepted way to describe the South's racial system among both blacks and whites, in its denotative meaning, suggesting separation between blacks and whites. It is not a very accurate term to describe that system. The system involved plenty of integration. It just had to be on the terms acceptable to white people. Indeed, the agricultural economy of the early 20th century South probably afforded a good deal more interracial contact in the modern urban ghetto. White supremacy is a more accurate description of what the system was about. Segregation is the way apologists for the South like to think of it. It implies we're not doing anything to black people. We just want to keep them separate from us. It was the most innocent face one could put on that system. When we use the term as a summary term for what was going on in the South, we are unconsciously adopting the preferred euphemism of 19th century white supremacist leadership. Um, with that, I wanted to turn to our other distinguished uh, panelists, Ms. Johnson, uh, to 
could you please offer some remarks? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Foster. I, my speaker went low, but I thank you gave, gave the uh, baton off to me. Uh, good evening to uh, everyone uh, involved in this uh, discussion. I, I think these discussions are very health, healthy because unless we remember our history, it will tend to repeat itself. And uh, I'm just glad to be here uh, to continue this discussion. I think uh, I'm glad I let Ms. Brown go before me uh, with, with all of the knowledge and information she has. And then she's a judge too. So, you know, I had to, I didn't know, but you always have to defer to a judge. <laughs> I have one that lived with me. My wife became juvenile court judge in Baton Rouge back in 1996. So thank you very much for your presentation. I just want to congratulate Ms. Odom on her appointment as the first uh, African-American female in that position. Uh, that's, that means we're, we're uh, making a progress. And the thing about it is we don't ever want the opposition, I always refer to them as the opposition, uh, to know or present that we are not making progress in America. Uh, we are making progress. We've, uh, we've come from a very long ways when you think about our people. And I just want to um, thank Chancellor uh, Pierre, who's a civil, he don't tell people, he, he's known as Chancellor Pierre, but he's a civil rights fighter in and of himself. You know, he uh, was instrumental in resolving the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board case which was the longest running uh, DSAID case in the state of Louisiana at the time that uh, he and attorney Arthur Thomas in my office, uh, Chancellor Pierre was the lead to resolve that case. You know, it's one thing, as he said, uh, in our case, it's one thing to file a suit, it's another thing to win it, but you had to get a, a good result at the end because if filing a lawsuit, you don't get a good result, it doesn't mean anything. So. I just wanted to say that kudos to him. And we call him all the time and ask him questions about other civil rights matters. I also want to thank uh, and acknowledge uh, Marjorie Broussard, who is the district vice president for the NAACP uh, in the uh, uh, Cadiana area. And I thank her for her work. Uh, I know she came up under Janelle Shakwa and uh, she filled some big shoes. And uh, I look forward to her continued effort to uh, fight for our people. And I know they're doing it over in the Lafayette area. Bishop Milton, I want to thank him very much. He's always at NAACP meetings, always have supported, even when we had the judicial lawsuit and we were going all over the state to organize the black attorneys because they weren't organized. And we knew that black attorneys had to be organized uh, in order to win that lawsuit. And uh, he was there with us at that time. And so just any everybody who's involved in this process. I just want to thank you very much. Uh, uh, you take the baton and keep running with it because we haven't made it yet. I tell people all the time, I never forget when uh, Katrina hit 2005, we were sitting around the table and uh, they were talking about getting these counselors in. Uh, the first thing they did was say everybody had to go to computers and register. And I sat around the table, I say, uh, you say register on the computer? Yeah. So do you realize that any given year, either Mississippi or Louisiana have the highest illiteracy rate than any other state in the nation. And a lot of people don't think about that, especially people who have college educations and law degrees. They really don't think about the fact that a lot of our people can't read and write. At one time, uh, Louisiana had a 40% illiteracy rate. I don't know what it is now. Uh, in the black community, it was higher than that. It's up to 60% at one time. Do you realize that Six out of every 10 black people can't read, can't read, can't write. So how do they understand? I serve as the executive director of the NAACP in Louisiana. And I get calls every day, 10 or 15 calls. And uh, basically it's trying to get people just to understand what their rights are, because it'd be in total confusion. And the judge mentioned about the police. Well, the police ain't gonna try to really tell them their rights. The police stop you. You got a right to be, be quiet. You don't need to tell the police, I got rights, read me my rights, but they got reasons for ways to get around it. Uh, voting, an educated voter versus just getting people to go to the poll. When they are educated and understand why they're voting, then they vote more. So we get what we call chronic voters. I call them habitual voters. All of us probably on this panel 
and in that audience, because we are interested enough in our community, we're going to go vote. Not because uh, David Duke is on the ballot and we want to vote against him, or Donald Trump is on the ballot and we want to vote against him. No, we want to go vote for the city council budget. We want to go vote because they're getting ready to change these districts this year. And if, if we don't stay on top of this redistricting, it'll be 2030 before we can get back up. Ah, 2030 is a long ways for me. It's a very long ways. And so we have to be educated. We have to educate our people. Rupert Richardson, I can't say enough about uh, Dr. Foster. Uh, Rupert Richardson started me off as an unpaid general counsel for the Louisiana NAACP in 1984. And if anybody ever been around Rupert Richardson, she can talk you into doing almost anything. And since 1984, I became first vice president and then president. Uh, she was with us when we marched on the mansion in 1996, 50,000 people. She couldn't walk that much, but she was in a vehicle and led the march in, in the front in the vehicle. And uh, in 2008, when the six young people were uh, jailed in Gina with 100,000 um uh, bonds. Ruby Richardson was, was right there in 2008. She passed not long after that. But she wanted to be around the movement and she was very instrumental. Take like what uh, uh, Chancellor Pierre said, when we won the lawsuit, uh, really we didn't go to the Fifth Circuit. We would have lost at the Fifth Circuit. LULAC versus Texas, they went to the Fifth Circuit and lost. Uh, the, the Fifth Circuit said they, they couldn't see how you have single member districts for judges. And reverse the case, even though they won on liability, but they reverse on remedy. But in our case, uh, we, Governor Elvis just got reelected in 91 and he promised he would settle the case and we settled. At the time we filed a lawsuit, we had five judges in Louisiana, three in New Orleans, one in Baton Rouge and one in Shreveport. And now we have more judges proportionally in, in Louisiana than in any other state in the nation. Uh, that was because we settled the case and dismissed it and it never went up on appeal. Uh, so we're thankful for Rupert Richardson, and I, I think about it all the time. This is what I wanted to do today. I just wanted to call off, and, and a lot of this would be redundant because everybody called off some years. I wanted to just name, just call off some years because I wondered, I said, well, why library don't want history? Why? And it was a grant. It wasn't no money they had to spend. Why, why they don't want the history? And that, that was, uh, I think, at the vote, I heard it was 5-2. So two thought right. They probably was black. And then five, I hope in the five, it wasn't no black. I don't know. But if it was one of the five that was black, we need to reach out and try to teach them their history. I want to start with 1857, the Dred Scott decision. A lot of people don't know about the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott was a black man. He left from a slave state and went to a free state. He had a trial in Missouri, 1857. The Supreme Court, for us lawyers, we understand that the court said he didn't have standing. He didn't have rights. And it went so far as to say if, if blacks came from a slave state, they didn't have any rights. Later on, their interpretation of that was the black man has no rights that the white man is bound to respect. But don't we see that? Everything we talk about, when we have to deal with certain white people, they don't want to respect black people that we have rights and we're still fighting for it. And so voting rights is certainly an issue, right? Because a, a billionaire white man like Donald Trump and the, the, the person over on the corner, street corner, that's registered to vote, they all got one vote, just one. Donald Trump tried to talk about it, say, oh, it's cheating out there because he don't want that one black guy vote to count. That's what it is. He don't want to have no rights. And so everybody around him that attract that are attracted to him, they all think alike. The black man has no rights that the white man is bound to respect. You guys have a celebrity over there in Lafayette that was, was seen taking a chair and knocking out a window in the Capitol. He's a celebrity. Why? He's standing up for the five that voted. Don't let them know the history. Because we're going we're gonna to still promote Dred Scott, but we don't want them to know anything about Dred Scott. 1863, Emancipation Proclamation. But why was that necessary? Because, because President Lincoln couldn't get anything done through 
the Congress that exists because they had Southern Democrats in there. So under the War Powers Act, Emancipation Proclamation, then he could go and fight the Civil War to ab abolish slavery. I don't want to deal with those, those 13, 14, 15 amendments. 1872, PBS Pinchback became governor of Louisiana for a short while, but he still became governor. We need the young people to know that we've had a governor in Louisiana that was African-American. Do you think they don't want that to be known? 1896, Plessley versus Ferguson, a black man on a train leaving out of New Orleans, going over the, the, the lake to Covington. Before Rosa Parks, 1896, I want to sit up in, the, in this area up here. I don't, I don't look at it as white or black. No, you can't do that. It was a crime. He was convicted. Ferguson was the judge in the case. Plessy versus Ferguson went up on to the Supreme Court, separate but equal. And that started the Jim Crow laws that was discussed earlier. And we, we know what we've been fighting against. Still fighting it, still fighting against them. 1898, the grandfather clause came out of Louisiana. Governor Foster's great uh, grandfather <laughs> was governor from 1892 to 1898 and passed the grandfather clause. What did it say? Well, if your, your forefathers, if your daddy wasn't registered to vote before 1865, there are some things you need to do. The black vote in Louisiana went from 40, 40, 45%. 144,000 black people registered to vote down to 1,500 by 1,900. No effect. We want the senator to stay encouraged. We want him to stay encouraged because what is going to come out of that Louisiana legislature this year? Chancellor Pierre talked about the, the, his, the historical numbers and what we've achieved. The question is, what is going to come out of that Louisiana legislature this year when it comes down to redistricting? And we got to keep everybody honest. We can't allow packing in black districts where you got 80, 90 percent black voters in districts. And then there are no voters over in those other districts because our opposition will allow us to do packing. We, we can pack these districts. But what's what's reasonable? A 60 percent district, a 65 percent district. It's up to us in the community to look at what's going on and to make the calls to keep everybody honest this year. 1947, during Jim Crow, we'll give you your own law school. We don't want you going to LSU, Southern University. Chancellor Pierre talked about it. The other thing that happened in Baton Rouge, which is significant, in, in 1947 is the, in the Baton Rouge plan of government. They call it consolidated government. I tell people all the time, that's a lie. They say, why? I say in, in Orleans Parish, the city of, of New Orleans is, is merged with Orleans Parish. That's a consolidated government. Baton Rouge don't have no consolidated government. And why you say that? I say that there, there, at that time, it was it was uh, two cities, Zachary and Baker, and Bat the city the city limits of Baton Rouge. Now we have Central, and they're trying to get another one started on the outskirts. But the city, the, within the city limits of Baton Rouge, you don't have a city council for Baton Rouge. You don't have a mayor for Baton Rouge. And you, look, we all right here. Southern University Law School, law centers right here. We don't have it. Some people say, well, we don't have no city limits of Baton Rouge. I say, well, why do we have a city court? Why do we have a city council? We have a city limits of Baton Rouge. We did have one. We had a city city council of Baton Rouge up until about 1984 when they took that and called it the Metro Council. Crazy. They, I guess they tried to do something like that over in Lafayette. I'd like to get some response because I think that that plan was tried in Lafayette. I'm not sure where they are with it because it looked like it went back up for a vote, but I'm not sure. And now, now this year, they introduced uh, Wednesday. Uh, see, because the city... but. The parish of, Baton, of East Baton Rouge now is majority black. Don't tell nobody. 53, 53% 53 
Now they're doing the, the census, we got to watch the count, but it's 56% black and other minorities in the whole parish of Baton Rouge, the capital city. Now you know what happens when, when there's redistricting with the, 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 the group that have the largest population, they get the largest number on the, on the Metro and all. Okay, so we got 12 people on the Metro Council right now in Baton Rouge. Seven in the white districts, five in the black. Will it flip and be seven in the black district and five in the white? Can you imagine that? Will that be history? But guess what? They came up with a plan the other day. They presented it to the council. They wanted to present it. And it said, well, we'll do six, six, and one elected at large in the parish. Well, why we need that? With the black people going to be in the majority? They said, well, we'll do six, six, so we even now. And I watched what happened. Black people said, oh, we even with the white people now is six, six. But no, you got that one running at large. And if you don't always get your black vote out right, that could be a white seat. But I say, I ask question, why, why should we change? And, uh, and we in the majority. But I, but black people, so we, we go along with all kind of stuff and they just get over on us. But I know one thing, it ain't going to happen this year. Uh, okay, so let me go on. So we had 54, Brown versus Board of Education. 63 was the March on Watch. 64, Civil Rights Act. 65, Voting Rights Act. 1981 was Stormberg versus James. And what happened, we didn't have to, in voting rights cases, to show intent to discriminate. All we had to do was show seven factors to win our cases. And basically, they were... Uh, Polarized white white racial black voting in at large districts because whites tend to vote for whites and don't 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 be scared blacks tend to vote for blacks. Uh, compact district cohesiveness. In other words, we could draw a district and we could break down the uh, the sections and uh, we applied that that standard in nineteen like. Uh, Chancellor said 1986 and Clark versus Edwards. And then we also had our companion case came out of that and the next year, Chisholm versus Edwards, which applied to the uh, Louisiana Supreme Court. And we eventually won both of those cases. Uh, justice Rivas Artigue was the first African-American justice in, in this, this cycle. And uh, Justice Burnett Johnson became uh, the justice after uh, Justice Artigue, and she became Chief Justice uh, based on seniority. And uh, we had a setback, uh, as as Doc said, Dr. Foster said, in 2013, when uh, Shelby County, Alabama, filed a suit against uh, the Attorney General Eric Holder, and uh, the court found that some people say they got rid of Section 5, which was a review for process, but I think what they say was, well, you know, times have changed and, and you guys live in better now. So we're, we're not sure whether or not Section 5 is needed. And so it, it was more like it's not needed. So now that we have gone into 2021 with uh, uh, President Biden, a majority uh, House, a majority depending on how the vote go, Senate, I think we ought to make sure that we have a national effort going to try to see what we can do about Section 5. I don't think we ought to just let it get by, because look, the, these uh, these Southern uh, jurisdictions are passing all kinds of, as you guys know, they're passing all kinds of rules that are not favorable. Look at what the library did uh, in not accepting the grant. In a voting rights case, we could use that uh, to help establish uh, some form of discrimination because to deny that to black voters, I think that's a pretty good uh, a social showing against the uh, Lafayette Parish Library. We just keep it. They think it, they think it was, it was bad, but it's good because I'm quite certain we're going to have some lawsuits, uh, ACLU and, and, and others uh, coming, coming in, in this state of Louisiana this year to put these people in check. And so uh, I wanted to just highlight those those issues. Uh, I know one thing: advocacy is alive and well in Louisiana. I'm just part to be. A, I'm just glad to be a part of it. And the Lord has blessed me to be on both sides. 
to be on the side of advocacy and to be on the, on the legal side. Now, I will say this about the legal side. As you know, Trump got the Supreme Court packed. And so if we file a, a, a local lawsuit, we got to go through the Fifth Circuit and then to the Supreme Court. That's what we need to think about. But politically, I think we need to get very, very active. I think we need to get more and more of our people out to the polls and not be discouraged. And the, the positive word ought to be, when we see negative things like what happened at that library, is that that is even more reason for us to go out and vote and get these rascals out of office. Thank y'all very much. I can say it because I'm not the chancellor of law school. I'm just Ernest Johnson, the attorney. So I, can, I can say stuff like that. <laughs> Thank y'all very much. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, Ernest Johnson. I learned uh, a lot through that uh, history lesson. And I really appreciate more than anything the kind of through line that you drew from 1857 to now in terms of how the Supreme Court adjudicates questions of uh, voting and black voting in particular. I should also apologize for not including uh, Dr. Burnham in this genealogy of black women's excellence coming out of Birmingham alongside Angela Davis, Stanley Sanchez, and so many others. So at this point, what I'd like to do is um, invite the panelists, uh, perhaps the elders on the panel, to speak to one another if there was something brought up that you all wanted to, to offer a commentary or a question about. And then we'll uh, turn to some Q&A. Uh, Let's yeah, start. yeah. So let, let, me, let me begin. It's uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the Plessy versus Ferguson because this is the 125th anniversary of of, of Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, and um, the of course interesting thing about Plessy versus Ferguson is that at least in this, it was it was a case brought in because of Louisiana. And it was 50 years later that Charles Hatfield essentially challenged Plessy versus Ferguson. The interesting thing you talked about Governor Foster was that uh, his grandfather was the governor. And of course, Murphy Foster, the grandson that we, we know as Governor Foster graduated from Southern University Law Center. So the irony of, uh, of, of all those things, of course, uh, is extremely uh, important to recognize. But the, the, the other point that I, that I thought that was very, very important was, uh, as Professor Burnham talked about, uh, her, her representation of Angela Davis. And, and I think the key to all of this is that the history of Black women being at the forefront of all of the changes, even today with respect to what happened in Georgia, it was Stacey Abrams and black women who have led that incredible change in the voting uh, demographics of Georgia, such that you essentially had the state of Georgia, which, you know, you know we said red clay Georgia, Stone Mountain Georgia, elect not only an African-American to the United States Senate, but a Jewish American to the United States Senate. And sometimes we forget all of those other uh, uh, groups that from a historical standpoint are viewed in the same light uh, by many of the uh, establishment and racist organizations as being not part of the uh, quintessential white America that they would want it to be. And, 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 then, and then the other piece that I'm always reminded of with respect to this, this, whole, this whole thing is that when I look at things like what was happening in, on January 6th, I think about what happened in Nazi Germany uh, uh, and, and the fact that Jesse Owens in 1936, 85 years ago, uh, went to to Nazi Germany and uh, crashed a myth about, about Aryan superiority, uh, even though he himself could not exercise the right to vote in a real way upon his return to the US 
uh, uh, after the Olympics. Well, thank you, Dr. Pierre, for um, those comments. Uh, at this point, we want to do some Q&A, and, &A and uh, we have 12 minutes, or do we have more time? So may, may I respond? I just want to Please. say, uh, uh, may I just say, uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, my fellow panelists, all of them. Uh, but I, I also just want to, I, 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 the name escaped me, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't call it here uh, in the little story that I told you about uh, our work. And that was uh, Daniel Bird and uh, A.P. Truro, who were involved in uh, the case I mentioned. And I just wanted to... Um, to say that uh, you know that we 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 also need to just commend the leadership uh, that this state um, has uh, played uh, across the South, but also across the across the country um, in in these fights uh, from the time of uh, early days, of course, obviously 1860, 1896, the uh, Plessy Ferguson, but um, but just more recently. Um, the leadership, not just from, you know, professionals, but also the journalists. Um, the Louisiana Weekly was one of the best uh, African-American papers. We would have no history at all to talk about uh, if the, uh, uh, the Louisiana Weekly had not been on the case, um, sort of doing its job. Um, and then I also just wanted to say just a word uh, in response to Ernest Johnson's um, comment, um, the uh, attorney Johnson's comment, thank him so much for all of his work. Uh, and, but to say, you know, uh, we all, uh, sometimes we always feel we all have to talk about, well, you know, we've made progress. And yeah, I, I would say we have. Um, it, you know, and one indication of that is, is that in Louisiana in uh, 2018 or perhaps maybe 2019, you know, in Louisiana and Florida led in the uh, enfranchisement of uh, former felons. Um, so that's progress all related to our access to the ballot and to the state house. Um, but, you know, we also have to think about, it's been a long time. So, so yeah, we made progress, but way too little progress. I mean, you, 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 if you look back and think about where we were, Jim Crow, slavery, um, you know, post-slavery, reconstruction, redemption. And here we are today still talking about police crimes against black folk, um, the miseducation of black children, uh, all of it, uh, dis dis disenfranchisement, sneaky ways of disenfranchisement. I'm like, really? Really? Are we still here? So, um, that's that's a rhetorical comment, I guess, more than anything else, as you take you off my scholarship hat and, and putting on my like a really hat. Um, but I did want to I did want to add um, the names of um, Dan, Dan lift up um, Daniel Bird and uh, A.P. Trero's names. Thank you so much, hey, Dr. You. Dr. Foster, if I may. I I cannot say no. Uh, to to add on to uh, and look, look uh, George, I was trying to think about AP two row and, and Daniel Bird myself, and that's a shame for me NAACP. But I also want to add into that group uh, Dean Lewis Berry, who was an attorney out of Alexandria. And uh, what happened? Uh, we had AP two row doing the legal stuff, and he associated with uh, Lewis Berry, who's an attorney up in Alexandria, to help with those those uh, civil rights cases in Louisiana. So. And since the Lewis, Lewis Berry Civil Rights Institute is here, I just wanted to li lift up uh, Attorney Berry with the name of AP Turo, because a lot of times we talk about AP Turo, but we don't focus on Lewis Berry, who was a civil rights leader, became the uh, dean uh, of Southern uh, Law School back when it was a law school uh, for a minute. He was my dean uh, when I first came, came to Southern in 73. Uh, I just wanted to lift up uh, Dean Berry. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Johnson. And I couldn't uh, echo um, Professor Burnham's skepticism of progress anymore. Again, it was progress that Chief Justice John Roberts claimed was the reason why a Voting Rights Act doesn't need to exist anymore. And I think a critical black history interrogates how we experience racial progress. So with that, I think we're gonna try and get three questions out so that we can get a sense for what people are thinking about right now. And then you all can choose which questions you want to respond to, but please try and keep it as short as possible. Thank you, Dr. Foster. My name is Jamal. 
My name is Jamal Taylor. I am an activist here in Lafayette, and I, I appreciate the historical context that I've gotten today from this conversation. So thank you so much for that. I also want to thank everybody that's here, and I hope I see you all at the city council meeting and the library board meeting too. Uh, Marja and Tara sit to my left and right at most of those meetings, and so I want to appreciate them for their advocacy and our, on behalf of our community. As I look around the room today, what I see is a group of seasoned veteran activists and a larger missing group of young people. More importantly, I, I question or try to think about how we might involve people and bridge this gap that exists across this state, particularly as it relates to advocacy. We so frequently hear, not that way, don't do that. But we have this set of performative posturing and peacock politics in Lafayette that restrict the movement or forward momentum in bridging that gap. And so I, I would ask my question to um, Ms. Odoms at the ACLU, how we might be able to bridge the gap that exists, because as I look at the lens through which I see this movement in Lafayette, I see people kind of hijacking it in a way that's not positive, where we can't get the answer we want from the activists, we call the pastors, where we can't get the answer we want from the people protesting, we call the politicians. And so how do we bridge that gap that has so fundamentally held us, held us back in this city? Thank you, Jamal. We'll get two more questions real quick and then we'll have Lana respond. My name is Ken Miller. And first I wanna thank Dr. Chris Williams for his continued service of the Lafayette community and all his public service. Um, th this question is for Mr. Pierre. Um, I was so shook up by January 6th that I actually have formed a polit political action committee called Blackthorn, and I've been all over TV and radio for about 30 days attacking anyone involved with the insurrection, uh, particularly our not esteemed Congressman Clay Higgins. Uh, Mr. Pierre, I've been hearing things from these people that call themselves constitutionalists, and they keep talking about we the people. When I hear that, I hear we the white people. I hear almost a white supremacist dog whistle. Am I reading that right, sir, or am I just overreacting to January 6th? Okay, do we have one more question, or do we have an answer? One more question. Yep. I think we better just go with what we got. Cool. So I'll have Alana and then Dr. Pierre. The Gap and January 6th, I think it is. Ms. Alana, go ahead. Wonderful. And um, thank you for that question, Jamal. I'm so happy to hear your voice. You have such a distinct voice and honestly, not just a voice that resonates um, over Zoom and in small gathering rooms like we are in now, but, but across the community. And so I think what you're doing by way of using your platform to elevate these issues and engage um, young people is phenomenal. So Jamal has a presence on TikTok and Twitter and, and Instagram and all of those places where we really um, reach and touch young people. But I do want to double click on Jamal's point of how we integrate our advocacy, if you will. So sometimes we do see um, where people are working in silos. So our elected leaders are not connected in the ways um, that they could or should be with um, community organizers. And the nonprofit space is disconnected from perhaps what's going on also in the community. And so what we've been doing at the ACLU of Louisiana is we've been holding listening sessions. And a lot of those have been taking place in North Louisiana. And wonder, you know, a wonderful byproduct, byproduct of that is that we've seen local elected leaders, council members um, joining those meetings. And so we've been combining and having um, folks from community. We've had activists. We've had citizens. We've had elected leaders and um, nonprofits all gathered in the same space. So I think we actually have to start calling out and breaking down these silos. And I think leaders like Jamal are really critical in helping 
us do that. And so it would also be wonderful if folks could join the ACLU of Louisiana. Sorry, I had to give a shameless pitch. I, I, I really, sorry, not, sorry, not sorry. We want you with us because we actually feel like we can be one part, one small variable in this um, opportunity to bring us all together in spaces. Of course, the NAACP is always that voice and always that convener as well. So join us at the ACLU um, and we'll continue to be an organization that believes deeply in integrated advocacy and making sure that we can reach young people, that we can reach elected leaders, that we can reach nonprofit, and that we can reach community activists and bring those folks all together. Thank you. Uh, all right, Dr. Pierre, we got about 60 seconds, so I just want to sure. put that out there. I know you could take uh, much longer to respond, but uh, I'll shut up. We can do it. Listen, he's right, and here's why. Because the, the great fear is the fear of a multiracial uh, democracy. That's the great fear. And that's where we're going to, a multiracial democracy. So as long as it wasn't a multiracial democracy, everything was okay. When multiracial democracy show up in the US, we see the pushback all the way around. Beautiful. Uh, so let's thank our amazing panelists for all they contributed to this conversation today. Uh, I'm very grateful to have uh, done a little job in trying to moderate it and, and I'm really you know, humbled to, to be in your all's presence ever so virtually. I wanted to reiterate that this is the Louisiana Literary and Speaker Series will ensure that Black history is discussed, not just in February, but moving forward. We will be monitoring public libraries, programming, and ensure Black history is a part of taxpayer-funded activities, the side of the truth. Over 100 books of Bending Toward Justice and Martha Jones Vanguard are being distributed to area schools, local libraries, youth groups, et cetera. To request books, call 337-501-7617. The number you should call to get a hold of these books is 337-501-7617, and please keep this item agenda on your minds as we think about this question of literacy and ensure that the Northside Lafayette Library is built and implemented. Thank you. All right, just wanna thank everyone once again for coming here, for being a part of this as we do for ourselves. Uh, again, wanna thank Lafayette Panalytic Council. We're sorry we omitted you. I omitted you from the, uh, I'll take the link. I omitted you from the program, but you will be listed with AOC and on the DVD. And uh, we have food for you. Uh, and before you leave, stop Norika, stop by her and uh, give her the information that she's going to ask you for, all right? Thank you so much for coming. You guys have a great evening. Oh, Judge Colbert. Judge Colbert. We recognize him twice. <laughs> Yes. Thank you all so much for participating. Everybody have a wonderful weekend. Again, um, Chris, if anybody can um, put the number in the chat for people if they want to get access to the books, that would be fantastic. Again, thank you everyone and have a good weekend. As I was saying, and I'm glad to be here, and I want to thank y'all for inviting me. I was actually here as a member of my fraternity. I was by office. However, since you gave me a mic, I want you guys to know that there are two bills being proposed right now by two of our local legislators from the, around the Million Parish area where they are targeting our two minority subdistricts. So again, they want to get rid of the two black judges here in Lafayette. That has been, and in speaking to judge, former Judge Rubin and former Judge Edwards, that has been an ongoing attack since those judgeships were uh, created back then. I am only the second or third, have you want to look at it, African-American judge in the 15th JDC. I may be one of the last. But if we vote, if we participate, if we do what it is that we should be doing, then uh, that shouldn't happen, Judge Colbert. Yes, absolutely. Again, thanks everyone for coming. Please stop by the table, grab you something to eat.